All right. Well, welcome everybody who's worshiping with us online, all of you who are here. Uh, it's, it's so good uh, to see more and more people come out in person. We know more and more people are coming online. Uh, I, I'm praying that third service is going to return soon. If, you guys, if, if the life keeps blossoming, then that gives me great hope. I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor here, and uh, so good to close out this series today. We began a series in the new year. In fact, Pastor Scott kicked it off uh, just under the word welcome. How are we welcoming? As the Hebrews, our, our tag verse has been, do not neglect to show hospitality, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And we said that we can't be in a welcoming spirit, and today's uh, scriptures are going to really drill that down again if we don't welcome God, if we don't ask God to be the Lord of our lives. We ask God to uh, welcome the new year. We know God is the, the God of the new year. We're not promised the new year, but we're in God's hands. And, and then the second week, I talked about welcoming the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? How do we welcome the, the active, living presence of God into our lives? Then Pastor Steve on Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday talked about building that beloved community that Dr. King talked about. How do we welcome that? A community uh, of all people, as we say, Revelation 7-9, that we try to reflect here at Garfield Memorial Church. And last week, welcoming others, and I said all others, not just people that are like us, not just blessing those who bless us. Jesus said pagans can do that but bless those who curse you. Pray for those who post nasty things about you on social media. Uh, I got a whole list of those. Um, you know, welcoming others, all others. And today I'm closing out with this Hebrews passage that Andrew read for us. Welcome strangers. Do not neglect to show hospitality. It didn't say just to your friends, to your acquaintances, to your family. Show hospitality to strangers. You know, God is really, really serious about this. And I'm preaching on Hebrews, but that's why I just had to have Andrew just slip in that little parable of Jesus from Matthew 25, when Jesus was reflecting on the end of the age. And he talked about there will come a day where God will come and judge the nations. The first time he came, he came in meekness and sacrifice. The next time he comes, he will come in power to judge the heavens and the earth. And, and when that day comes, Jesus gave an illustration. It's gonna be like separating lambs and goats and, and, and the lambs he'll put on his right side, that's a place of provision. That's a, he's seated at the right hand of God interceding for us with salvation and to those on his right hand, to those who listen to his gospel and live. to strangers where you may have entertained angels but I'm, I'm gonna tell you man I seriously am from the south side of Youngstown stuff like that I dang near hit the deck I did I, I actually preached a revival this is a true story a while back um, there was some churches up in Ashtabula County and I had preached this big event and there were some pastors and they said well you probably never come preach for us but we want to do a, you know revival and we only got four little churches I said you bet I'll come for you and they had the uh, revival in a horse barn I'm from Youngstown. Did I mention that? I'm a city boy. Um, and I'm in, this, I'm in this place and it's, uh, I don't like country western music and I'm not really keen on Confederate flags. There were a lot of all of those things around and they had all these balloons behind me when I preached and every about five minutes, one of them would pop. And I swear to you, I hit the deck three times. So I just froze, okay. Um, anyhow, I'm back. What was I talking about? Uh, hospitality, welcoming the stranger. God is really serious about this. When Jesus said, someday I'll separate the righteous and the unrighteous. And you know the parable. It's a really well-known parable. He said to those on his right, yeah, come into the kingdom of my father. And he said, I was hungry, remember? 
You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me water. I, was a, I had no clothes, and you brought me clothing. I was in prison, and you visited me. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Come into the joy of my Father's kingdom. Then he goes to the people on the left side, and he says, you are cursed of God. I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I didn't have clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was a stranger and you didn't welcome me. Now I'm gonna tell you, the Church of Jesus Christ does a pretty good job in America of feeding the hungry. We built clean water wells, other people do that, bringing water to the thirsty. Dude, we've got some really interesting and wonderful prison ministries, Christian Kairos and other things. We do clothing drives all over the, all over the country in our churches. Do you know what our churches in America really fail miserably at? Welcoming the stranger. I was in Dayton all last week. Some of you know I was leading a, a, a doctorate uh, intensive of 300 doctoral students, and we have a cohort, and I'm leading it, and I'm also they're giving me a doctorate, but I'm doing my dissertation. And, and the people that were down there were the folks from Barna and Glue. Have you seen any of the commercials of the He Gets Us? Yes. You've seen those? If you watch football today, you'll see them? Because uh, they, they've, they, that, that campaign's going to cost a billion dollars when it's done. And, and Barna and others are in there, and they're trying to, you know, share the, the good news of Jesus. And Jesus, really, he was cursed, and he knows what it's like to be alone, and, 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 and trying to do it. And the guys from Barna shared with us, I shared this with church council the other day, they did, they did multi-million surveys leading up to that campaign. And uh, the responses they got were interesting in trying to help us know how to connect with people in today's culture. 84% um, of people responding to those surveys had a very favorable view of Jesus. 84%. You know how many of them had a favorable view of the church? Any guess? I said 12%. It was 11%. Do you know the only other institution in America that only gets 11% approval? Congress. Congress. And that broke my heart, and I'm, I'm realizing why. Because we're feeding, and we're clothing, and we're providing social services, but we are not welcoming people who are not like us. We're just not very good at it. You know, my, my wife and I, we're a district superintendent. I, I hate to say this online, but I'm just going to go for it. And you know, my wife is African American. I'm not. Uh, and uh, we went to a district there. There were 18,000 Methodists in 80 churches, and Terry was the first person of color. And uh, she would like to go secret shopping, and she would go to churches before they knew who she was. You know, she showed up at two churches, and the greeters at the door said, are you lost, honey? True story. Um, and, you know, we don't do this well. Now, Garfield, I want to, no, we're, not, we're not a perfect church, and we're not, we're just a different church, but the reports we get from the hospitality and the love that people feel when they come in here are pretty outstanding. But we can never let down our guard. Because God is so serious about this to the point of hellfire and brimstone if we don't. In fact, if I start preaching on Sodom and Gomorrah, you won't hear anything else I'll say. But let me tell you, I was raised in a church that they told me that Sodom and Gomorrah was judged for a particular sin. And I went to seminary and found out that was a lie. It was not true. There was only thing, one thing Sodom and Gomorrah was judged for was the sin of hospitality. Showing violence and non-receptivity to strangers, and those strangers happen to be angels, if you read the story. That's how serious that God is about this thing. And so hospitality is really a spiritual discipline that we don't talk enough about. It's a spiritual discipline every bit as important as prayer. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. Now, if we Google hospitality, uh, we'll get things like hotel chains and vacation resorts or how to throw a Mar Martha Stewart gala in your home, right? And that is almost the exact opposite of what hospitality is in the scriptures. It's receiving strangers. It's receiving exiles. It's receiving foreigners. It's receiving in one place the widow and the orphan, the poor. It's pouring our resources into people who may not have the world's goods that we do. So what this takes, I'm going to try to go, I was preaching a little long this morning. I don't want to preach that long. And I lost about seven minutes with our gunfire. Um, the first thing that this really takes, I want to talk about the makeup and the mindset of a hospitable community. 
There's a makeup and a mindset. We, Hebrews is writing about what the early church was like. And it's really interesting. I just want to flash this at you. If you read verses three through five, it, 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 it says in verse three that, you know, treat those in prison as though you were in prison. And our, our translation this morning was treat the tortured as though you were tortured. That really is not a good translation from the Greek. The Greek word that was translated tortured there is actually treat the oppressed, those who are victims of social injustice, as though that injustice was happening to you. And then verse five, that was verse three, verse five says, be lavish and generous with your money and pour it in for the building up of the community. Now, if I say to you, um, you know, a, a radical commitment the Christians had towards social justice, um, a, a absolute uh, passionate commitment to the poor, generous with money for social causes, what does that sound like? That sounds liberal, right? And then right in verse four, it says, but don't defile the, the wedding bed and God will judge adulterers and our translation was fornicators. That word in the Greek was a general word that said anybody that has sex outside of marriage. And let me tell you, that was a radical thing. The Christian community was the first community, I think in civilization, that said you should not have sex outside of marriage. Everybody in the Greco-Roman world was having sex outside of marriage. It was just expected, right? And so they're saying, in the midst of being radically generous and, and passionate about social justice, also, and that's for the building up of the community, also build up the community by being radically faithful in relationships, covenant relationships that become the foundations of families. And that sounds rather conservative, doesn't it? And both of those distinguishing marks are about the Christian community. So if you'd ask the early church, are you liberal or conservative? First, they'd have no idea what you were talking about. But I would tell you, you say, Chip, what are they? Are they liberal? They're conservative. And the answer is, yeah. See, because they weren't defined by categories like we are. And because of that, because the grace of Jesus Christ, did you hear about be strengthened in your heart by grace, not by food regulations. You're like, what's that about, Chip? That was about religion. It was about the religion of the day. Don't just go through the motions and think that you're earning your salvation, but be strengthened in your heart by grace, by what God has done for you and Jesus Christ. And if that is your founding story, then you're going to be hospitable to everybody. Not just people who agree with you, not just people who, you know, uh, tend to vote like you. You are going to have an expansive love. And that was a mark of the early Christian community. They loved everybody. In fact, there was one letter written to an emperor by a guy named Trajan. He was a, a local magistrate and they were trying to kill off the Christians. And you know what he said? He said, these Christians are multiplying because of their generosity and love. He said, we take care of the Roman poor, the Greeks take care of the Greek poor, but these Christians take care of everybody. It was a mark of who they were. In fact, when the plagues came to Rome and people were dying, I mean, massive cities in Rome would die from the plagues. This is well recorded. And there was no sanitation, so it spread like wildfire, killed off uh, tens of thousands. Do you know family members would flee to the hills and leave their other family who were sick behind? Throw their children out into the street. You know who stayed behind and took care of them? Christians. And they nurtured and, and cared for these folks at the cost of their life, the same people who were feeding them to the lions in the Colosseum. That's a heart of strengthened by grace and a demonstration of radical hospitality. Okay, what does it mean to show hospitality to strangers, to entertain strangers. The word for that of entertain strangers, that was the King James, or show hospitality to strangers. The word for that in the Greek is this word, philoxenia. Ever heard of that word? Most don't. Let me ask you this, go to the next slide. Have you ever heard of this word, xenophobia? <laughs> Have you heard of that? Yeah. yeah, we've heard of that, right? What is xenophobia? It is fear of strangers fear of foreigners, fear of people who are different from us. That is xenophobia. Have you ever heard this word, the next line? Uh, you probably heard this word, Philadelphia. What was that? City of brotherly, sisterly love, right? That's phila, Delphia. It's love for our folk. So philoxenia is love for strangers. It is the cure for xenophobia, fear of strangers, and for Philadelphia just loving people like us. 
Philozenia is what God calls us to, right? To love strangers. And in that day and age, uh, there were rules for hospitality, but I'm going to tell you the early church and God blew those rules out of the the roof. Hospitality was a prime um, core value for the ancient Roman Greco and ancient world because it was like a prid pro quo. We all needed hospitality. In fact, Zeus, you remember Zeus, kind of the big God? You you may not know this. He was the God of hospitality, the God of travelers. Because traveling in that day and age, if we go traveling, what we do? We make an itinerary. I always do. I've got achiever strength. I drive my wife crazy. Um, here's where we're going. We're going to this, and we're going to visit that. But we look for hotels, right? Terry and I tend to get, we go to get an Airbnb, make our travel plans. How do we get there? But in that day and age, you didn't do that. In fact, most people didn't travel. Travel was extremely dangerous. It was very, very difficult. Very few people did it. So there were no hotel chains. Right? There weren't, because there was no industry for it, because too few people traveled. So you were dependent on hospitality. You were dependent on this. And there were four codes of conduct. I studied this in the ancient world for hospitality. First, there was the invitation. So if you would go to a new town, you would go to the city gate. You would go to a well. You would go to some public place, and you would stand there. And someone from that town would come out to you and invite you into their home. That was stage one. Step two, there was screening. (laughs) People would vet you a little bit. They want to make sure we're not inviting in marauders who are going to run out of our house and take over the city at night, right? So there'd be a little screening going on. Three, then, when you took them in, you were obligated to help them bathe and to feed them and not just pull out microwave stuff, but a feast. (laughs) It was expected to have a feast. And then the great thing about this, and I I wish I could uh, put these uh, rules up on my house door sometimes, especially around Christmas, if you were a guest, you were only supposed to stay two nights. (laughs) And I go, that's how it worked. That's why I would have been, right? But that was, that, was, that was a rule. It was a responsibility. But God takes this aspect of hospitality and he blows the roof off it because if you read what God said to the people at Sinai, watch this. It's in Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 19. It says, for the Lord your God is God of gods. I want you to know who's speaking here. Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who what? Is not partial. He is not, I'm not the possession of any particular people or nation or country. I show no partiality. That's what Peter found out in Acts 10 at Cornelius' house. And I take no bribe. I execute justice for the orphan and the widow. And I love the strangers, providing them with food and clothing. You also shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. See, what God is doing now is he's triggering a whole new basis for hospitality. It's not just a code of conduct. It's not just prid pro quo. It's not just stay two nights. No, you need to show hospitality to the weakest members of community, the widows and the orphans, the poor among you. You need to pour into their lives. And you need to remember that you were strangers. You were foreigners in Egypt. And I brought you out and then you were in the wilderness and you were dependent on my hospitality to take care of you, to bring you food from heaven and to bring you water from a rock and to give you uh, sun by, by light by night and shade by day. And my salvation was in my hospitality toward you. And if you have been saved by grace, strengthened by grace, not of your own works, the Bible says, that anyone should boast, but by the work of God in Jesus Christ, who though he was great, humbled himself and took on the form of a servant and was obedient unto death for us, even death on a cross. And that one who said, while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Colossians says, Jesus Christ died for us. If you've been saved by grace, you are confessing that you were a wanderer on this earth. You were trying to be your own God. You had no interest in me. And Jeremiah says, digging down, trying to provide wells for yourselves, broken wells, 
that could provide no water. Jeremiah asked, what did your ancestors find worthless in me that they chased after worthless things and became themselves worship? You better recognize where you've come from and you can just look straight ahead and pretend I'm preaching to the person next to you. But you know, if you look over your shoulder a little bit of your time before God, before you understood what he had done for you, there's some stuff in that story. You may not tell me, you may not even tell your spouse. You definitely won't tell your children. I'm getting nervous now that I'm 60 and my kids are grown. They're starting to hear stories about me. Dad, we didn't hear this when we were 10. But we were aliens. We were foreigners on this earth. And you better start loving others the way I have loved you. Because nobody was stranger than you. I always say that when it's hard for me to be patient with people and love unlovable people, God says, now you know how it's like, Chip, for me to love you, for me to be patient with you. So take your possessions, take your things, take your money, take your home, and spend it on people with less of the world's goods than you have. That's hospitality, and when you do that, sometimes you're entertaining angels unaware. And, and I heard one scholar say, you know, when, when we say that entertaining angels are aware of saying through these acts of hospitality, there's what he called a sacramental quality. What does that mean? What's a sacrament? We only have two, baptism, my favorite Sundays here, communion Sundays, my equal favorite Sundays here. And, but what is baptism and communion? It's taking ordinary things, water, bread, wine, things that were everywhere in Israel. But God took those ordinary things and he used them to do extraordinary power through them. And do you know when it says, when we practice hospitality to strangers, that there's a supernatural aspect to it? It's saying that you could go out for a cup of coffee, something very ordinary, with somebody and listen to their problems. And God's power can do amazing things through that. You, you, can, you can go to the single mom up the street in your neighborhood or your apartment complex and say, hey, we've never met, but I'd love to have you and your kids over for a bite. And you just come in, you don't interrogate them, you just welcome them and you make a little care package after and say, it's good to finally meet you. And God can do extraordinary things through that. See, we think we're from East Cleveland. We need seminars. We need programs. We need PowerPoint and bullet points, and our agendas are on the five-minute schedule. But do you know it's those off-the-radar things where there is no agenda? And Jesus is just waiting for a woman at the well or interrupted by a man who climbed a tree that God does amazing things. I was down doing this doctorate seminar, you know, and I'm waxing eloquent, and, you know, we got speakers up there, and we're doing all these things. Man, these are doctoral students, right? And everything was intense, and people were like, okay, Chip, we're on the clock, and, you know, and all this, everybody's running around, the, the presentations are great. You know what I remember the most about this week? When Terry and I would just go out with some students, have a bite to lunch, and meet people. We were with a ministry couple from Virginia on Friday. Well, I promised Tiana she was watching my dog, and I told my daughter, I said, honey, we'll leave by one o'clock. We'll be home by four. I know it's Friday, don't worry about it. Um, we met this ministry couple. We went to have lunch at noon. We said, you know, we gotta be on the road by one. Do you know what time we left? Four. <laughs> I had to call Tiana and say, well, I said we'd be home by four. I promise we'll be home by 7.30. But I got home and I took her to dinner too, so hospitality. But it's through those simple things that God can do extraordinary things. John Piper wrote, preached a sermon on this once, and here's what he wrote. He said, when we practice hospitality, we experience a refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality rather than becoming self-decaying cul-de-sacs. I love that. He said, you're the recipient of God's hospitality. The joy of that will decay and die in, in your life if it doesn't flourish in you through hospitality to others. We should always be thinking things like this as Christians. How can I draw the most people into a deeper experience of God's hospitality? By the use of my money, by the use of my things, by the use of my home, by the use of my church home. Who right now needs re reinforcements in the battle against loneliness? Who needs to be asked out? Who needs to be asked in just because they are lonely? What two or three people's complementary abilities might explode in a new ministry if, I had two hour, if they had two hours together to brainstorm over dinner at my house? 
And who are the outsiders? And who's being overlooked? I got to tell you, I am married to the queen of hospitality. <laughs> That's why her title in our church is the director of hospitality and membership care. And she's always noticing people who might be on the outside. I got permission to share this this morning, but we have a, an individual, um, it's, it goes to our heritage service. And um, he walked into this church, he walked into this service, I think it was five years ago, it might've been 2018, could have been 2019. But he walked into this service and he was looking around and, and see as Christians, we always need to look at the people who look confused or not sure where they're going and, and, and be hospitable and how can we help, right? And Terry noticed she was in the back as she always is flying around the lobby and everywhere else. She's like, I can hear him preach at home. I don't need to hear him preach on stage. And she's all over the place. And she noticed this guy walked in and he sat down in a back pew and he held his hands up and he started to cry. And he wiped his tears, and she said he only sat there like three, four minutes and got up and walked out. Now, what do you think Terry Free did? She, she is in hot pursuit, you know, in a loving way. My wife is the only person at this church, I heard her name turn into a verb. I would say, well, how did you find out about this? I got tarried. <laughs> but she walked over, she said, oh, excuse me. She said, um, I, I don't, we haven't met. My name's Terry, and they had a conversation. And, and she said, I just wanted to get to know you. And, he shared with her that um, he hadn't been to church in over 30 years, um, but he had just retired. And the week he retired, he went home and his wife told him she was leaving him for somebody else. And he said, my wife and I were married in this church somewhere in the building, I don't know where. And he said, it sure didn't sound like that service. <laughs> but he said, I just said, maybe I could get some closure if I came out here and, and just sat for a minute. So. I don't really go to church, but I just sat for a minute. And Terry and him had a conversation, and, and she prayed with him and said, you know, it would bless my heart if I saw you here next week. And she said, in fact, I'll go to both services. You come to the one you want, and I'll be waiting for you. And he came back. That was five years ago. You know what that individual does right now? He's a member of our board of trustees. He's on our leadership team. <laughs> and uh, I'm not making my wife a saint. What I'm saying is, that was just a simple conversation. That was water, bread, cup of wine, conversation in the lobby. But God, in his mercy and that he has loved us, does extraordinary things to ordinary, what might seem by the world's standards, ordinary things. Um, boy, I'm out of time. Let me, let me, let me do something with you. I, I want to... I'm going to probably go about three minutes over, but I want to tell you what are ways we can do this. If you're a, a, a resident of Greater Cleveland, if you're a member of this church, I just want to flash eight things by you, ways that we can personally do this individually and collectively, okay, that we can do it. And then I want to give us two quick resources for it. First, individually, what can we do? We can invite people in your neighborhood or your apartment building into your space. In, in, whatever your space is, maybe it's your home, maybe it's a favorite coffee shop, just invite people. Guess what? A lot of them are not going to come. They're going to try to figure out what's up, what are you up to? Maybe you're an insurance salesman, or maybe you're a Mary Kay consultant, and they're not going to come. But some will, and even those who don't will wonder, why, that felt kind of nice to get an invitation. Secondly, invite colleagues, friends, associates, and neighbors into your spiritual home. Where's that? That's the church. It, it could be worship. It could be a small group. It could be a local mission. Flora Mark, our outreach coordinator, is uh, February 11th, that Saturday, a week from Saturday, is down in Seoul, and she's going to be teaching on the Chinese Lunar New Year, which I don't know much about, but in our diverse church, I want to learn about. And Terry and I were just looking at it, and we said, who is somebody we met in the community that we could just invite? Hey, come on down to us with that, because that's kind of, you know, it's not uh, something as scary as a worship service. And, and then we could say to them, hey, just come down with us, and afterwards, we'll go out and eat, and we'll pay. You know, what can we do to the inviting people in that way? Thirdly, um, make room for the table. Do you know, we had a whole series on this. Get out of the tablets and get back to the table. We need to eat together. We need to break bread together. In, in that series we talked about, Jesus spent 80% of his ministry at table. In fact, he got in trouble, somebody said, for eating food with the wrong people, loving strangers. 
And that was our whole principle of microchurches, not agendas, but just to, to find ways to do that. Do you know they're building new houses and architects said there's one room they're not building in new houses, it's the dining room. Because people don't use them anymore. <laughs> they eat in front of the TV and we need to get back to the table. Fourthly, um, host a small group or a microchurch in your home or favorite spot and witness people's lives change or just sign up for one. I want you to think about that. Corporately, what can we do? Corporately, you could help with our care ministry, our visitation ministry, our meals ministry, food pantry. It doesn't take much. You don't have to do this all the time. You could do it once a month. You could find out there's one person I could visit, you know, every two or three months, and it might change a life. You can volunteer at Kids Club, Youth Ministry, Building Hope in the City, those things that minister specifically to widows and orphans. You could join Radical Hospitality, be an usher, serve at the cafe, join the worship and tech team. There's a big announcement about that. Uh, go to children's check-in and, and help with check and kids be in a parking lot and fourthly most importantly search out strangers on Sunday I know some of you come up in, in the main lobby and I love seeing you I don't see you all week and sometimes I can seem really rude because I'll have friends come up to me and I'll say wait 10 minutes <laughs> and off Terry and I go to, to find somebody we don't know just do that stay a little longer the games today aren't till three it's no one o'clock game. You can, you know, really plan out. Don't make your lunch reservations right after church. Give it 30 minutes, right? There's a lot of places. And just stay six or seven minutes and, and meet some new people because you know what you're doing? You're doing hospitality and you're going to turn strangers into friends and ultimately possibly brothers and sisters. And you might entertain angels without knowing it. Now, how do, what's, the, what's the power to do this? The power to do this is what God has done for us. I call these two great resources. I'm gonna flash them real quick. Two great resources. The first one is found in what God has done for us. It was in that verse, uh, Hebrews 13, 5, where it says, if you wanna keep your life free from the love of money, you wanna be content with what you have, you wanna be a free person to be hospitable, remember this, that Jesus has said, God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, I want to tell you something in the English. I, I talked about this a lot, Heritage. I'm just going to flash it to you. That's a terrible translation of the Greek. I've taught you before in the ancient languages, they would use what's called double entendres. You would say a word over, over to emphasize how much passion. So when David's son Absalom died, he didn't say, oh, Absalom. He said, Absalom, Absalom. Jesus would say that when he wept over Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's emphasis. Do you know what this literally says in the Greek? I will never, never leave you, and I will never, never, never forsake you. Five nevers, <laughs> emphasizing the unconditionality of this. Jesus doesn't just say, I'll, I'll never leave you, sweetheart, I'll never leave you, Chip. He says, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. And when that drills down in your heart and in your soul, You'll be free to be hospitable and loving to strangers. And then secondly, it says Jesus also suffered outside the gate of the city to sanctify, make us right by his own blood. What's up with that? Jesus was an insider and he was thrown outside and killed. For those of us who are outside, that's Genesis 3, we want to be our own God and we were outside and we're trying to get back in the gate, right? And we're a weary wanderer at the gate waiting for somebody to come get us. But guess what? Remember that screening part? Remember that vetting part? If God, the holy God, would vet us at the gate, you know what he'd find out? These are, these are marauders. If I let them in, they're going to pillage the city because they want to be king. They want to be their own God. Colossians said it this way. It said, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies of God because of your evil behavior. But Jesus went out so that we who are exiles could come in. And Ephesians says it this way, I'm gonna wrap this up. Remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought nearby by the blood of Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners but you are members of the household of God. This coming week, it's, it's gonna be two years since my dad, my earthly father passed away. We lost him to COVID 
in February of 2021. Before he died, when I'd visit him, he was, you know, we were talking faith, we'd read some scripture, and, and then he would say to me, he said, uh, you know, he said, God told me he's going to give me Jesus' room in heaven. I'm like, wow, reach for it, Dad. I mean, just, I'll take Peter's room, man. I'll take the, you know, the blind beggar's room. You're going for, he said, yeah, God told me he's going to kick Jesus out and give it to me. I'm a theologian, man, and I just said, I tried to clean it up, and I said, Dad, you know, that's kind of what happened. Jesus was kicked out of heaven. He came down for all of us so that all of us would, would get a room, and he said, no, I'm getting Jesus' room. In my heart, I wasn't going to have an argument. I thought, Dad, you are one of the biggest narcissists I've ever heard in my life. I really, that was my first thought, and then my second thought was, this is just a dementia. Leave him alone. Man, when I was reading this passage this week, I wish I could tell my dad I was so wrong. He was so right. God kicked Jesus out so that you could have his room. He kicked Jesus out so I could have my room, have his room. Jesus, yes. (laughs) God said it, that settles it. It's hard to believe, it really is. And Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. Because in my Father's house are many rooms. And if we receive this hospitality of God and are saved by it, there's a room even for one with my name on it. And when I know that, I will go out and make room for others. So you know what we put on my dad's tombstone? What scripture? In my Father's house are many rooms. So let's go to the outsider. Let's go to the stranger. Let's go to the outcast and the poor. Let's look for those people and let's be hospitable to them as Jesus Christ was hospitable to us. And when we do that, we may find out that through simple acts, we're entertaining angels without knowing it. Thanks for the extra time. Let's pray. Lord God, we are here because of your radical hospitality. Shame on us when we close our borders so tightly that only people like us can squeeze in. But we know, God, through Jesus Christ, that the gate was thrown open for us. I love the picture you give us in Revelation where the gates of your holy city are open night and day. You don't close doors, God. You open them. Thank you, Jesus, for opening the gate for us. Will you give us the courage to go out and open doors and extend passion and love to strangers, people who are different from us, people who we may not understand. But the truth is, Lord, sometimes we don't even understand ourselves. But you know us, and you love us, and you call us. Help us to go with that spirit to love and to call and to hold and to heal others. In the strong name of Jesus, amen.